Hello and welcome, my name is John Dickinson for Boris FX, and in this walkthrough tutorial I'm going to show you how I created this comic book look using a range of different Sapphire effects that you may not be familiar with. So go ahead, download the project file, the link is in the description, and let's get into it. Okay, so let's start by double clicking the comic book treatment comp. And we're going to walk through how I set this up and then we'll take a look a little more closely at some of the Sapphire effects and see how we might be able to fine tune the look. And if you're following along with the project file, you'll notice that your version isn't animated and that's because I've saved only the first frame to keep the download size to a minimum. All right, so scroll down to the bottom and double click cartoon treatment. And in this comp is where I created the cartoon treatment. So we'll take a look from bottom to top, starting with Night Sky. And Sapphire Night Sky is used to create a realistic starry night sky. It is highly customizable. I've kept it fairly simple here. But you can set night skies according to the year, month, day, hour, even the minute. And if we look under Effect and choose Night Sky Locations, you can even choose a location of a sky at a particular time. So very customizable. You've got glares, streaks, twinkle, and I do have a little bit of twinkle in here. We just drag the time indicator, you can see the stars are twinkling on and off. But as I said, kept it fairly simple, but in the past I probably would have used fractal noise or something like that and just created a faux night sky. It's nice to be able to have an effect like this that I can drop on and not have to mess around with something like fractal noise. Okay, so night sky is the base. Above that is the all-important moon. And to create the moon, I use Sapphire Luna. And Luna has a lot of different settings. We are going to come back to this at the end and tweak some of these. So we won't go into these now. So I'll just skip up to Cloud's Perspective for now. Now, Cloud's Perspective, importantly, sits above Luna because I wanted to have the look of clouds passing in front of the moon. And if we just press UU on the keyboard to reveal the change parameters, these are moving from left to right because I have the shift speed X set to 20. And that's a pretty low value. They're only moving very slowly. And they are changing slightly as they move. And that's due to the boil speed. And I've got that right down on point 0.1. If I increase that, you can see the clouds really go crazy. And that's great for things like fire effects and stuff like that. I only wanted this very subtle. And it's almost unnoticeable, but they are just slowly changing very subtly as they drift across. Now I've set the blend mode to screen, and of course screen drops out black, so we only see the clouds or the lighter areas in front of the moon. So it's fairly subtle. Luna does actually have its own atmosphere setting. And if we increase the glow brightness, you can see how we start to get a smokiness around the moon. I'll just bring up that atmosphere amp. So that's definitely something I played with. I ended up keeping it fairly subtle because it was getting a little bright having that glow value too high, that glow brightness value, and it was blowing out in the final comp. As I mentioned, we'll come back to Luna and we'll make a few tweaks at the end. I'm just going to undo that. One other thing I want to mention about Cloud's Perspective and why you'd want to use this as opposed to something like a fractal noise, uh, these parameters here, latitude, swing, and roll. You can see I've set latitude to minus 26, and that allows me to get this faux 3D effect, which is really useful. I didn't need to change the swing or the roll, but these settings definitely set this apart from something like a fractal noise and put the perspective into Cloud's perspective. Okay, so those three layers together comprise the background. Above that, we have all the 3D objects. And this scene was modeled by me in Blender and I unwrapped this in Ryzen UV and textured it in Substance Painter and I rendered the various passes out of cycles in Blender. So let's double click that composition and come in and double click island. Now I've turned off the anchor rocks and the water because they're getting a separate black and white treatment using hotspots inside this comp. 
One thing I wanted to point out is the alpha add blend mode. I'll just come down and set these to normal. And you might have noticed a small change there. It's going to toggle the transparency here. And this is one of the things you get when you render out different passes from 3D. You can actually see the transparency at the border where the different 3D passes meet. Just turn that on and off. So that's no good because you're going to see any of the pixels from layers below coming through those gaps. And this is where alpha add comes in. I just choose alpha add. That combines the alpha channel of the different passes and fills up that gap. If I just alt click on show channels, there's the alpha channel. Let's make this normal again. And now it's really obvious. Check that out. So if you've ever wondered what alpha add does, that's what it's used for. I'll click again. So keeping the island separate, which is the anchor, the rope, the skull, and the sand. Let's come back into combined hotspots. And you can see I've used the hotspots effect to get the black and white look. And hotspots really is designed to find the brightest areas of a clip. But it's also a great way to desaturate and increase the contrast at the same time, rather than applying a saturation effect and a levels effect, for example. And the reason I've applied it separately to the water, island, and rocks is because I've used slightly different settings. If I use the settings I use for the water on the island, which is increasing the threshold, you can see it goes too dark and I start to lose that important detail. You can see on the water, I've got a threshold of 0.42. And if that's too low, the water looks too bright and too friendly. I wanted the water to look a little darker, but not too dark where we start losing some of that important detail. And the rocks as well. Without hotspots turned on, you can see they're fairly flat. But just adjusting the threshold again on the rocks, if I take it to 0.42, then they go almost black. And with zero threshold, they're too white. So just fine tuning that just to get the sweet spot. We've got some bright area. That's actually a little bit of bird poo. <laughs> and we've got some nice shadows in there. So just splitting that up rather than applying hotspots to the whole thing as one layer. And this is the look so far. The moon actually looks like it's been rendered with the 3D objects, which is pretty good. I have helped the situation somewhat by putting a light behind the island in Blender. You can see how that's being picked up on the anchor. So your lighting in your 3D is really important. Got to consider the lighting, obviously, when you're thinking about the later composite and how these objects are going to work together. I also placed a big point light just above the water so we get this big bright area here so it looks like the moon is being reflected off the water. Okay. So that's the black and white treatment. Let's skip glow darks for a moment and we'll come up to half tone. This is the first step in the cartoon look. We just turn that on and <laughs> you almost don't notice any change. It's really subtle and I'll show you why. We have the blend mode set to screen. And if I hit T to show opacity, you can see it's only 30%. Let's increase that to 100 and bring this back up to normal. So you can see that's the result. So I've made this super subtle and by using screen, it's only affecting the brightest areas because I am actually using half tone again in the comic book treatment comp. But at this stage, I wanted things to be really subtle and I have adjusted the dots light and parameter just a little You can see if I just adjust that, I can just increase and decrease the areas that are affected by the half tone. Now above that we have Sapphire Cartoon and this is giving us our main cartoon look. You can see how turning it on it increased the contrast and it started to pull out some of the edges and it also posterized the layer somewhat. If I just reset this you can see that's the default look and it's not quite what we want. I actually did come in for this one and load a preset 
and chose this one down here, Cartoon Strip by Angie Taylor. This got me really close. So increasing the contrast and starting to look a little more like a comic book. Notice there is a mask here. Let me just come in and just turn that off. You can see how without that mask, this area is actually quite dark. So I've just used a soft feathered mask there just to hold that area out. You can't even tell that it's not being affected by the cartoon, but it's just keeping some of that detail in there. Otherwise, it's too dark. So I do use masks in After Effects in this way, just to hold out effects where necessary. One other thing I will point out when we're talking about contrast is this setting down here, Offset Darks. Many of the Sapphire effects have offset darks, and I love that it's built in because it allows me to increase the contrast without needing to apply another effect. So look out for offset darks when you're using Sapphire. Okay, let's come back to Glow Darks. And I want to just focus in on this area here. You can see I've masked off this adjustment layer. and I felt that this wasn't quite dark enough. If we've got this directional light here, I thought this was too bright. So if we turn that on, take a look at how that increases that contrast and adds some shadowing in this area. It's almost like ambient occlusion in 3D. Let's turn that on and off. Really helps actually bring out this detail on the skull. And of course I could have used levels or curves to increase the contrast, but glow darks gives that soft fall off to the shadow. Above that, we have the edges in direction effect. And this was actually the first time I'd used this effect. And we just turn it on. Take a look at this. I use this effect to add some directional specular highlights. It's really quite effective. I have masked it off in certain areas. Take a look at that in a moment, but check this out. We just select it and grab the direction X, Y. See when I move this around, we can actually create directional highlights. And I've restricted that to just the anchor, the rope, and the skull by using another pre comp and the rocks actually, just another pre comp with all of those layers inside it. So that's being used as a mat and just choosing alpha mat, anchor, rope, skull. So edges in direction really helps those pop out. The difference. And getting back to the masks here, let me just turn these off. You can see that was actually making it a little too bright in those areas. And obviously, if they're facing away from the light source, they're not going to be as bright. So I just mask those areas out. I did want some light in here because my initial pass of the anchor, it was quite dark and I was losing all of this great detail that I'd modeled in. So I did light that area just subtly in Blender so we could see that detail. So with Halftone Cartoon and Edges in Direction, we're certainly getting there with the cartoon look. Above that, again I'm using Anchor, Rope and Skull, the same pre-comp. This time I'm using Sapphire Edge Detect. Just gonna turn that on. And this is adding even more extra bright detail. Now this isn't directional, but I just felt it needed a little more detail in there. Let me just turn that on and off. You can see I'm actually using the soft light blend mode, so it's pretty subtle. Come up to normal, so it's really strong, and that's way too strong. Edge Detect can really overpower. And if we just reset that, you can see Edge Smooth by default is 5.3. Gonna undo. I've actually brought Edge Smooth right down to zero. And we'll just bring back soft light. So just adding a little bit more detail in there. So that's the main cartoon treatment. And obviously this is all pretty subjective. I was applying these effects and adding a little bit, removing a little bit, deleting the effect, adding another effect until I kind of zeroed in on the look that I thought looked good. Above that, we have some lighting effects. The first is Sapphire Rays. And that's used to add these subtle but spooky volumetric rays. S-Rays also has its own atmosphere, which is perfect for this. 
you can see I've increased that slightly. If I just bring that right up, you can see we really start to get a lot of detail in those rays. We might come back and adjust that later maybe. In my final look, I wanted it fairly subtle, but it's nice as with the atmosphere in Luna to also have atmosphere in the rays as well. There's a few effects in Sapphire that actually have this atmosphere setting. Above that, we have Sapphire Edge Blur, and that does what you'd expect. It blurs the edges. That gives this nice spooky glow, which works quite well with the rays. And to have it only affect the light pixels of the layers below, I've set the blend mode to lighten. And that's given us this light wrap style effect, and it's particularly effective on the anchor. Let me just turn it on and off. You can see the difference. It's wrapping that light from the moon around the anchor and all of these uh, key foreground objects. And also the uh, top of the skull here. Okay, so that's the cartoon look. But you may notice a couple of layers at the top here and they're turned off. When I was designing this, I actually rendered out a depth pass from Blender. Just solo that. And you can see it's named Mist. And that's because in Blender, you actually use Mist to create the depth pass. Below that, we have ZD Focus on an adjustment layer. You can see how I've used the Mist layer as the Z buffer for ZD Focus. And that's giving this nice blur at the front here. And this, of course, is really useful for adding depth of field style blurs to your renders in post. But I felt that it was actually removing some of this really nice detail, so I ended up not using it. And I've left it here in case you'd like to do some experimentation. Now let's take a look at how the comic book treatment was set up. We'll start with the comic cell layer. Let's just solo that. Okay, so this is actually using a shape layer. Just press U twice on the keyboard. Hold down the control key and twirl up contents, and then let go of control and twirl that open again, and that's closed everything up. So this is created from a number of different operators, and you can add those from the Add menu. I'm gonna turn off these ones. So we've got a fill and a stroke, and we've got a rectangle, and I've added a second rectangle. Just up the top here and add it just using the shape layer tool up here. And below that we have the merge paths operator. And merge paths is set to subtract, so that cuts that out. Beneath that we have the round corners operator, and that just rounds out those corners, which is great. And of course this is all live, so I can come back and change it at any time. Shape layers are really handy for this kind of thing. Now beneath that is the Cartoon Treatment Comp. And you can see I've used the Set Mat Effect and I'm using Layer 18 Comic Cell as the mat. So that's cutting out the Cartoon Treatment. Notice also that Comic Cell is set to Multiply. So that drops out the white and keeps only that black outline. Next is the Narration Box. Just a simple shape layer. You can see I've got the color here, the fill set to a pale yellow. I actually did some research on Google for old style comic strips, and that gave me inspiration for the colors. And this particular layout was an example that I saw online for a, a real, I think it was 1950s or 60s comic, maybe a little bit earlier than that. And you can see I've adjusted the round corners with that one just to fit in here as well. Above that we have the text. And I've used a couple of free fonts from DaFont. This drop cap is bada boom. And just select the text. That's Anime Ace. So they're both available for free from DaFont.com. Notice for the drop cap, I've actually used half tone color. And that's given me that half tone look. Just to match the look that I saw in those comic examples. Okay, now let's skip halftone for a moment and come up, just turn these off and we'll just solo the skull. 
Now the skull and water sand rope anchor and also sky and moon, these are colored solids and I'm using these to just unsolid that to colorize these individual objects. So we will focus on the skull first. You can see I've set the blend mode to color. And I'm just going to turn on the mat here. And just talk about the effects I've applied to this. There's the matte choker effect and the edge blur effect. So matte chokers just pulling in that mat. And I've used sapphire edge blur just to very subtly blur the edge. Let's turn that on and off. Now the reason I've used this as a mat is because I wanted to kind of emulate that printing error you often see on comics where the color is not always in registration with the lines. And you can see if I turn that mat off. That's what I mean. Just in there. I was going to turn half turn off again. We'll look at that in a sec. If I turn that matte off, then the color's perfect because it's using the matte that was rendered out of Blender. So it's perfect registration. But by choking the matte and also just applying a little bit of edge blur just to soften that a bit more, just gives it that less than perfect comic book look where the registration's not quite right and the color is slightly bleeding. And you can see I've done the same for all of the other layers. So these are all exactly the same. We've got the water and we've got the sand and we've got the rope and the anchor and the sky and the moon. So with that in mind, let's just come and turn on the half tone effect again. When I was using this half tone color effect, I actually had it above everything. I had it right up here. Just turn off these layers. So I wanted to add some colored half tone in, but I felt that this sort of overpowered everything. You might like it like this. So rather than have it at the top, I decided to have it underneath this. So this way we're only seeing it in that area that was revealed using the matte choker effect with edge blur. So it adds a little bit of that color half tone without overpowering everything. I just preferred the sort of black and white half tone in the majority of the areas, but it's nice to add a little bit of that in. It just gives it a little bit of irregularity and, you know, an imperfect feel. Notice how the rocks are completely covered with it. That's because the rocks don't have a colored solid. They're still using their original black and white. So this is a second pass of Halftone on top of the one that I added inside the cartoon treatment comp. And it just has that little bit of color in those areas just to add that irregularity. A couple more layers to go. The first is paper. And you can see that's added a fairly realistic paper look over the top. Let's turn that on and off. And I did actually use a stock image originally for this, but I thought, well, why not use Sapphire Effect Builder to create my own custom paper? Let's quickly save and let's go in and take a look at how this was set up. Let's click on Edit Effect and that'll open up the Sapphire Effect Builder. And this is an often overlooked area of Sapphire. It's very powerful and it's a way of combining different Sapphire effects together to create your own custom effects and presets. Now it looks a bit scary, but let's walk through this. Let's actually come to 100%. Just holding down the right mouse button just to get the hand grabber tool. And make sure preview selected node is turned on and we'll walk through this. So first of all, I've got the texture noise emboss effect. And you can see I've named this base noise. So that's adding the base. And I've also got sapphire grain. And I've got this actually quite large. You can see, hopefully on the video, it's actually big, soft grains. I pulled out all of the color amplitude. And if I bring that up, you can see there's the grain, but it's actually very subtle. Now I've combined those using Sapphire Layer. 
the bass noise is going into the foreground and the grain effect is going into the background and they're combined using the overlay blend mode. So it is very subtle, but we're getting a combination of the two. Next to that, we have Texture Noise Emboss again, and we have Sapphire Distort. So Sapphire Distort is adding a little bit of irregularity to that. And combining those together, once again using Overlay and Sapphire Layer, gives us that. And I use the layer effect a lot when I'm working inside Builder to stack effects in this way. Now beneath that, we have Emboss Distort, and I've used a little bit of Texture Noise Emboss and pass that into the bumps port. And above that we have the emboss effect. And sapphire grain again. So going from emboss to fire grain. And on this side I wanted to add a little bit of extra dirt. So I've used texture noise emboss, sapphire distort, sapphire hotspots, sapphire gamma, and a little bit of Sapphire Distort Blur, and patch that into the foreground, and all of the rest that we created so far into the background to create that look. And follow that with Sapphire Gamma. So <laughs> it might seem a little bit complicated, but I just built it up step by step. And once that was created, I set that to Multiply, and that gave me a pretty convincing old paper look. At the very top we have one more adjustment layer, and this is using Sapphire Vintage Color 3 Strip. Just to give this a subtle vintage color treatment. You can see it increases the chroma, and also adds this yellow cast. I've changed the tint to a very, very, very pale yellow. And just adjusted the amount, not too much because it makes it too oversaturated. So I thought this was the perfect effect for bringing this more in line with that vintage comic book colorization I showed you earlier. Why don't we just now quickly go back and take a look at some of the settings and see if we can make some adjustments. Come up to view, choose new viewer. And this one's locked, which is great, so we can keep an eye on that. And choose cartoon treatment. Let's take a look at Luna. This is a really fun effect to play with. Obviously we can change the size of the moon. And the lunar phase is really fun. So that's actually quite nice as well. I left this at 180 because I want it to be a full moon. Notice though how when I change that, we start to see this bump detail in the side of the moon. Let's bring that back a bit more. That's really nice as well, check that out. See all the bump detail? And we do have a bumpiness parameter here. If we increase that, we can get even more detail in there. Isn't that interesting? I'm gonna undo that. One thing I might do is just come down and increase the glow just a little bit. We talked about this earlier. Let's bring it up a little bit more. That's nice, it's giving it a bit more of a glow. As I mentioned, not too much because we start to get this kind of thing going on where we lose some of the detail. But this way I can come in and just increase the atmosphere amplitude and start to get a little more smokiness around there. So lots of settings in there to have some fun with. One thing I would like to do, and I didn't do this in the final, come back to the comic book treatment, and I wonder if the moon is a little too blue. What about if we just grab the mask tool here and then just drag out a mask, just holding down shift and the space bar just to move that into place. And for this we'll choose subtract and hit the F key for feather and just feather that out. Just wonder whether that will make the moon look a little more interesting.
I don't know. What do you think? I'll just increase the feather a bit more. Hit MM. And just adjust the mask opacity. Yeah, it just removes a little bit of that blue. Maybe something like that. Just double click that. And bring that out a little bit like that. Another thing that might be also good to adjust is the cloud's perspective. See if we can add a little more cloud in there. We'll come back to cartoon treatment and come over the cloud's perspective. Hit U twice. And let's just play with the brightness. That's going to be too dark. So we've got to increase the brightness. Definitely adds more clouds in there, but once again, what can happen is because of all the effects that we've used to create this treatment, it does tend to flatten it out and we get these, you know, large areas of flat color. So I guess when I was creating it, I just wanted to find the sweet spot. You could also adjust the clouds colors. Maybe just bring that up a little bit. Yeah, it kind of does the same thing. Maybe I'll just bring that up just a touch like that. So this is a nice way to work. Once you've got everything set up, just have your final comp in a new viewer and you can go through and just do some fine tuning. Because you may have set up the effects at a certain level with this look. And once you've applied all of the other effects, they don't quite look as you expected. So it's nice to be able to go and tweak those effects while you're viewing the final look with all of the effects turned on. Okay, so here's the final adjusted look. Hopefully that's helped you discover some useful Sapphire effects that you can add to your workflow. Be sure to leave a comment with any thoughts or questions. Those of you who haven't yet tried Sapphire can learn more and download a demo version at borisfx.com.